Thanks, Marisa. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so uh, as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about LIT or laser interstitial thermal therapy for radiation necrosis and refractory brain mets. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, and by way of overview, I'm just going to introduce this technology, which uh, may be newer to uh, many of you in the audience, and then talk about the application for refractory brain meds, radiation necrosis, and then touch a little bit on the little that's out there uh, using LIT as an alternative to SRS for upfront treatment of brain metastases. Um, so LIT. Um, so this is basically a concept of thermally ablating a lesion via a stereotactically placed laser probe. So this is done in the operating room by neurosurgeons, um, and it's done in conjunction with MRI guidance. Um, and the probe is placed uh, uh, via image guidance into the heart of the lesion that you are targeting. And then laser ablation occurs over a period uh, that can stretch up to about three hours during which the patient is under anesthesia, after which they are awoken and observed for one night in the hospital. So a number of contrasts with SRS, which is of course an outpatient procedure um, uh, uh, that are important to note when considering the cost effectiveness of this approach. Um, the other advantage of LIT, however, because of that invasiveness of it or compared to SRS, is that a stereotactic biopsy is commonly performed before the ablation, uh, which can be informative uh, for a newly diagnosed lesion or um, uh, in the setting of a prior treated lesion to get a sense of whether there is necrosis or viable tumor, at least in the area being, uh, being sampled. Um, so the components of LIT include the MRI, the gantry, the machine, uh, which is uh, serves to confirm that your the tip of your uh, catheter is localized in the center of the lesion, um, and uh, the tip will often be adjusted in real time so that you may perform the procedure at multiple foci along a lesion, particularly if it's cylindrically shaped. Um, the MRI also allows you to perform thermography um, and uh, post-GAD sequences to look for diminished enhancement post-ablation, as well as perfusion to look for decreased uh, vascular uptake um, uh, after the ablation is completed. The laser system is connected to the patient sitting in the MRI, um, as shown uh, here. And then outside the MRI is the workstation, uh, where the surgeon uh, and, the, um, uh, and uh, the rest of the team will sit and uh, perform the lesionectomy. Um, there are two FDA-approved uh, systems for uh, LIT. Um, the first one that was approved was approved in 2007, uh, Visual Ace, which was uh, uh, acquired by Medtronic after its introduction, um, involves a uh, narrow uh, 990, 980 nanometer wavelength uh, continuous laser um, and cools the tip via saline, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then has a slightly narrower outer diameter. Um, subsequently, two years later, um, uh, a competitor came along from Monteris, um, um, which was uh, approved in 2009. Um, this one has a uh, larger wavelength and therefore achieves a higher tissue penetration, uh, but does require longer treatment times and cools via carbon dioxide rather than saline, um, which doesn't really have major implications other than just the difference in technology. And then the outer diameters are larger, uh, which makes the probes more rigid um, and less prone to bending or inaccuracy, uh, but uh, does not change the target size you can achieve with uh, Monteris. However, um, anecdotally, there are folks who say that um, uh, uh, larger targets can be achieved. Uh, that hasn't been proven in, in the, the literature to date. So at UCSF, we have the first system, the Visual Ace, um, a, uh, in the Mission Bay Hospital up and running. Uh, and we are in discussions to acquire the second um, uh, because they are sort of complementary uh, in, in terms of their approaches. Um, and these are just an examples of this is a heat technique, and so you need a, a cooling thing. Otherwise, the tip will just continue to heat in an unregulated manner, and so you need to be able to regulate the temperature. And for that, you actually have feedback loops where there is a fiber optic temperature sensor um, uh, in the probe, uh, and then cooling, which is achieved via either carbon dioxide or saline, as, as mentioned on the previous slide. Um, and so thermal injury is, is really a function of temperature. Um, and in the case of uh, uh, the tissue that we're talking about, 
the uh, obviously, if you get above 100 degrees, you will vaporize everything intracellularly and extracellularly because you're basically boiling water um, and cell membranes will rupture. There's a zone between 60 and 100 degrees, which will instantly denature proteins and cellular components and cause instantaneous tissue coagulation. Um, but uh, really where we're working at is this zone that is ablative, but still considered safe, which is 44 to 59 degrees, where you will get time dependent thermal damage, uh, thermal denaturation of proteins and cell death, but in a time dependent manner. And that's why the procedure can stretch up to three hours because you're looking uh, to achieve cell death within a particular zone. And then below 43 degrees, you actually get uh, consistently recoverable injury. And so that's really not where you want to be within your lesion. And so there's your temperature sensor, which gets you one reading of temperature. And th this can be corroborated with MR thermography, which also will measure the temperature at distances away from the tip of where you're performing your, your lesion. Um, and so this is the most important zone, which is at 44 to 59 degrees. And so in terms of the basic science of this, your tip will end up being surrounded by three zones. And as I mentioned, we're in that sort of 44 to 59 degree zone, but the upper half of that is what we call the central zone. So anything above 50 degrees where you get consistent coagulative necrosis, albeit in a time dependent manner, uh, but typically within 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the precise temperature and the tissue density. And then um, there's a peripheral and transitional zone outside of the tip, which experiences temperatures from in the lower 40s, 41 to 45 degrees. And this can be sublethal thermal injury, um, uh, but these cells will be vulnerable to further injury. And this is where um, some of the uh, biology, this becomes interesting in terms of synergistic treatments, because in this zone, you get increased blood flow, which can increase radio sensitivity and delivery of chemotherapy. And you also get um, a lot of release of antigens and heat shock proteins, which has been theorized to uh, maybe be potentially synergistic with immunotherapy. And there is an ongoing clinical trial expected to enroll about 16 patients out of the University of Florida, combining LIT with pembrolizumab for um, recurrent refractory brain metastases, the results of which have not yet been released. Um, and then the normal surrounding tissues, um, the high temperatures will dissipate quickly, but there is still some component of released tumor antigens uh, felt to stimulate an immune response in these zones as well. So the first indication that's been uh, looked at, and, and I think it's really two indications that overlap significantly, um, but uh, which is SRS refractory brain metastases followed closely by radiation necrosis. And so this was first described in 2008. And since then, uh, 184 patients in eight studies have been described. And, and that's only patients in whom um, the stereotactic biopsy prior to the lit confirmed viable tumor. Um, and the literature suggests about a six month progression free survival of 67 to 73%. And this correlates very nicely with the extent of ablational lesional coverage. And so if you have histologically viable tumor, you generally need to get over 97% lesional coverage. Um, in order to obtain a durable progression-free survival. Um, the results are comparable to craniotomy, not necessarily uh, craniotomy with brachytherapy, as Steve talked about, but just resective craniotomy. Uh, however, craniotomy is, is certainly better at resolving symptoms of mass effect that some of these patients will have. And as a result, most of these uh, series that have been published have limited their um, use of lit for these indications to lesions that are less than three centimeters in maximal diameter. Um, it is very important to get tissue before lit, um, uh, not just to inform you know, sort of what you're dealing with academically, but really to inform your lit treatment plan. And, and that's because in a post-SRS gadolinium enhancement, even with perfusion, you don't have 100% confidence as to whether you're dealing with radiation necrosis and versus viable brain metastases. And Javier, who comes after me, will delve into more detail on this. But these are just uh, examples of three cases uh, of radiation necrosis on the left versus viable brain metastases, all post-SRS on the right, um, but really um, imaging looked very similar in these cases. And that's important because the threshold for lesional control and the sitting of viable brain metastases being treated with lit after SRS progression is higher than it would be if you're just treating radiation necrosis uh, with lit. And so that is where the, the biopsy component comes into play, although admittedly it's, it's spatially limited 
to the uh, just sampling the tissue at the area um, at the center of your tip. It's not necessarily a whole spatial sampling of the lesion, but it at least can help guide your treatment. Um, and so, of course, the parallel component to this is, you know, the use of lit to treat pure radiation necrosis after SRS for brain metastases. Um, and so, as Steve alluded to, radiation necrosis occurs after 9 to 14% of SRS for brain meds. I think the UCSF series he was talking about reported 12%. It's self-limiting in about half of the cases, but in the other half, it, it some sort of intervention will be needed to resolve uh, the imaging or the symptoms. LIT was first used to treat radiation necrosis for brain metastases in 2012, so a bit newer than, uh, than the use for refractory brain metastases, but still about a decade of good data in this, uh, in this indication. And this is all based on the hypothesis that thermal injury as I said, causes coagulative necrosis and would actually thrombose the proliferating endothelial cells that are felt to be responsible for the imaging findings and the clinical features of uh, symptomatic radiation necrosis. Um, and what I've shown here is actually a, a very nice meta-analysis that was um, published uh, last year in Journal of Neuro-Oncology, which pulled over 18 studies looking at bevacizumab versus LIT for radiation necrosis after SRS. Comparable number of patients received bevacizumab versus LIT. Um, obviously not a randomized trial and subject to the usual limitations of a meta-analysis. Um, interestingly, both approaches were very similar in terms of their degree of symptomatic relief, which was approaching about three quarters of the patients and the ability to wean off steroids, which was about 90% with either approach. Um, Bevacizumab did have a slightly greater rate of radiographic response, um, in fact, quite a bit greater, almost double, um, which is consistent with bevacizumab's effect on imaging in general. Um, in terms of survival, though, LIT had a greater uh, overall and progression-free survival at about 18 months in these patients. So take that with a degree of salt, but at least gives you a sense that both are effective treatments for radiation necrosis with some slight differences between the two. And this is just an example of a case of a 52-year-old who had uh, radi radiation necrosis after SRS for brain metastases, um, and then um, underwent um, lit, and then immediately you get an MRI uh, T1 post GAD immediately after lit, and you see this classic eggshell appearance that you've broken down that wall of enhancement. This is the post ablation, what we call subtraction MRI, which shows the uh, the thermal map. Uh, overlapped with the imaging and shows that a complete ablation based on thermal map and thermography was achieved. Um, this just shows no perfusion after the ablation. And then six months later, there's a radiographic involution, which is what you like to see when you treat SRS um, uh, with LIT. Um, and so lastly, could LIT be an alternative to SRS for brain metastases? And the bottom line is not really at the moment. Um, it's uh, not really been extensively studied uh, due primarily to, as what Steve alluded to, just the tremendous effectiveness of SRS, as well as the fact that SRS is an outpatient procedure. Um, it's readily adaptable for patients with multiple metastases. LIT, on the other hand, um, is uh, challenging when treating multiple lesions um, and involves a hospitalization and anesthesia and an inpatient procedure. Um, and so as a result, the reported cases have really been limited to a handful uh, that are embedded within larger series. Um, and so I would say this is an area that we can stay tuned for, but I would not anticipate this uh, being a situation where LIT overtakes SRS as a primary treatment. Uh, it was just something I wanted to touch on uh, under the broader umbrella of my topic of LIT. So in conclusion, you know, what do we what are the indications for LIT for brain metastases? And I should mention that several organizational attempts uh, to formulate guidelines, uh, including the joint efforts by ASCO and the neurosurgical societies have uh, as of now stated that um, there is no um, evidence to support or refute its use, but we certainly suspect by the next time the guidelines are revisited um, that a role for LIT will be better defined. But for now, the way we think about it is uh, in patients who've already gone SRS and have imaging consistent with either radiation necrosis um, or refractory uh, uh, re or uh, recurrence after SRS, and if the lesion is less than three centimeters in diameter, the things to consider that might tip you towards the use of LIT would be um, areas that are surgically inaccessible, so making surgery with 
with or without brachytherapy, not a great option. Uh, patients who are poor candidates for open surgical resection, supertentorial lesions, I didn't get into this, but lit in the posterior fossa is, um, is an area that's felt to be of concern due to the potential for edema in a tight space. Uh, patients' preference for the minimally invasive option compared to open surgery. Um, and less significant symptoms, because as I mentioned, lit is not as effective as open surgery for resolution of symptoms. And so those are some of the air, uh, considerations that would make you lean towards lit in this indication. Uh, in contrast, infratentorial locations, larger lesions that are close, uh, that are surgically accessible or just uh, symptomatic mass effect would all be indications for operating with or without brachytherapy, as Steve alluded to, um, in, the, um, in the setting of post-SRS imaging recurrence. And so with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your for your time and uh, open to any questions. Patients do amazingly well after neurosurgery. You know, I, I've been amazed at how, like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, you know, people will be like staggering into your clinic, uh, you know, six weeks after they had surgery. And now it seems like, uh, you know, people just bounce back. Uh, and is that because surgical techniques themselves have been improving or... And uh, I, I guess to some of these other approaches, you know, we're always trying to decide like what works better. I feel like uh, is it is the is just is just the pro progress of medical care improving, or 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 is it are we just understand better who to select, or are we just doing a better job of selecting patients, or is it that you guys are just getting so much better? That <laughs> so yeah, that's a good question. I think um, oh yeah, in terms of um, the uh, the sort of bigger, large craniotomies, what I would say has has changed a lot is certainly technology and and speed. So operative time is you know for the comparable cases compared to a decade ago has been cut in half. So less time under anesthesia is associated with quicker wake ups and quicker recoveries. Uh, that's been shown pretty consistently. Um, and so just operative speed, reduced blood loss, all the things that can slow recovery. Um, we've also gotten tremendous insights into uh, tractography and and mapping and and the ability to preserve function while taking out large large lesions. And so I but I I do think there are still sort of deeper lesions uh, that are more intimate with white matter tracts where we know that resection would be associated with those types of recoveries that you were describing historically. And for those, I think these sorts of less invasive approaches still have a, uh, give us a very viable option so that the craniotomy patients are focused on the ones that we know will have good recoveries. I just had um, two really quick comments. One is um, the NCCN did include lit, but for second recurrence of brain metastasis, I think. So it's like on page, you know, like <laughs> six or something. Um, so that is an option. Um, and then uh, there is also a really interesting clinical trial that I'm sure you know about called the remaster trial that Peter Fetchy is put together for patients who have imaging changes concerning for necrosis or recurrence. And they actually get randomized based on on the, the, the etiology of the, uh, you know, imaging changes. Um, so that might, there might be a trial we could even potentially join. Um, it's just now opening, but, um, if there is interest we might be able to get into that. Yeah. This is a space where I think, um, you know, it, it was mentioned in the beginning, the need for clinical trials and at least in terms of surgical trials, this is definitely a space that, um, is going to be very important to be a part of because as, as mentioned, we, we, you know, we don't have the kinds of, uh, um, guidelines as to, you know, the best indications for this treatment and the trials will play a big role in that.